So let's talk about the joints. This is going to be relatively short because I kind of feel like it's um, a little bit better if you can actually see what these joints look like, um, especially the synovial joints. So I'm going to add a video from YouTube that actually has animations of what the joints look like and how they move for the synovial joints. <clears throat> it's an artist's video, um, I guess, for knowing how to draw, um, but it actually does have very good animation to it. Um, I'll try and remember to put the time where you should start if you want to see the animations. <clears throat> okay, or if you want to, you can just watch the whole thing, whichever you feel more comfortable with. The joints. So we actually have kind of two ways to categorize joints. We can categorize them based on whether or not they move, they move a little bit, or they don't move at all. Um, and those that don't move at all are called synarthrosis. Those that move a little bit are called amphiarthrosis. And those that are completely mobile, we call diarthrosis. But when it comes to anatomy, it's better to categorize them based on their anatomical structure. So we have three types of joints this way as well. We have the um, fibrous joints. Fibrous joints have two bones joined together um, by fibrous connective tissue. <coughs> Not COVID. <clears throat> Sorry. Then the second category is actually cartilaginous joints. Cartilaginous joints are going to be joined by cartilage, obviously. And then the most complex anatomically are going to be the synovial joints. The synovial joints are the ones that are the most mobile. They're the ones that move around the most, even though some of them don't move all that much, actually. <clears throat> so let's talk about the fibrous joints first. In the fibrous joints categories, we've got sutures, we've got syndesmosis, and we've got gomphosis. One of these you already know from our um, skull. So the sutures. The sutures are interdigitated bones. Remember that that means that they're actually caught in each other. Digits or fingers interdigitated means that they're kind of interwoven like this. So they're interdigitated bones that um, are held together by this fibrous connective tissue. Um, and you know that we've got the coronal suture, the lambdoid suture, the sagittal suture, and the squamous suture, excuse me, as examples. So if I were to point to one of these and say to identify it, and then say, what type of joint is this? You would tell me that it's a suture, okay? Now, a syndesmosis. Syndesmosis are when you have two bones that are being kind of held together by ligamentous tissue or connective tissue. And your radius and your ulna are a real good example of this. Without flipping your arm around, if you take somebody's arm and kind of do this, it slightly moves. It doesn't move a lot. It's not supposed to move a lot but it does have a little bit of movement to it. So if we were going with the whole physiology or physiological classifications, this would be an amphiarthrosis. It's slightly mobile. The suture would be a synarthrosis. It doesn't move at all. Because <clears throat> the last thing you want is for your skull bones to move and hurt your brain. But this is a syndesmosis. Um, some others are the stylohyoid, the stylomandibular, and the tibiofibular. Um, but this one's kind of the one that everybody knows the best. <clears throat> now, the third fibrous joint is called the gomphosis. The gomphosis is when you have two pegs that fit into a socket, and then you've got ligamentous tissue holding it in place. So that picture is kind of small. Here's a bigger version of that picture. You can see the tooth. Here are the ligaments that actually hold that tooth in place. Periodontal disease is when these ligaments start to break down. That's when people start to lose their teeth. So you've got the two pegs of your tooth fitting into 
um, the socket in your mandible or your maxilla. And depending on the tooth, it may just be one peg. It may not be two. Okay. So the cartilaginous joints, you have two kinds. You've got synchondrosis. And if you think about it, chondro, what's the most common type of cartilage? Hyaline cartilage. So synchondrosis are going to be two bones being held together by hyaline cartilage. Symphysis, you just learned this in the bones, is when you have two bones joined together, but instead of hyaline cartilage, it's fibrocartilage. <clears throat> so fibrocartilage is bouncy, kind of like a racquetball. It works really well for um, shock absorption but it doesn't really move around a lot. It's not really designed to move around a lot. It's more because of the characteristics of the fibrocartilage, it moves a little bit. The um, synchondrosis, they don't really move that much um, either. And to be honest, a lot of them don't move at all. <clears throat> so the synchondrosis, synchondrosis is when you have hyaline cartilage between the two bones. A good example of this is actually the growth plate. So in our bones, we've got these lines of cartilage when we're actually growing before we hit puberty and stop growing that put down cartilage and it gets replaced by bone. Put down cartilage, it gets replaced by bone. One of the things that I mentioned in one of my earlier videos was um, bone can't grow from nothing. It always has to have some type of template to follow. That cartilage, yeah, that's really hard to do. That cartilage there is actually putting down the template and then it gets replaced. This is a synchondrosis though because you do have two pieces of bone being held together <clears throat> by hyaline cartilage. Now, think about this. If that's living tissue and I grind it or move it, I'm risking killing those cells. So this is a non-mobile joint, none whatsoever. I don't want any movement here. Um, some other examples, and again, this is when you're little before you actually um, have all your bones solidified. Remember I told you that the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis were actually three separate bones that fused together? Well, this right here is that piece of cartilage that's there for a while. <clears throat> the costal cartilage between the rib and the sternum, this is hyaline cartilage, and technically it's two bones being held together. So technically it is a synchondrosis. Now, the symphysis joint, difference. Instead of hyaline cartilage, now we have fibrocartilage holding the two bones together. Intervertebral discs are a good example of this. So <clears throat> in between all of our vertebra in our back, we have these little pads of fibrocartilage. And remember I said it works real well as a shock absorber. So think about it this way. When you walk, you're putting pressure every time you step. And when you jump, if you didn't have that little piece of fiber cartilage acting like a shock absorber, your bones would hit each other, which wouldn't be comfortable. So we've got that. One that you already kind of know, and you know it by the name symphysis, is the pubic symphysis. Again, this is actually fibrocartilage holding two bones together. And just by the nature of that fibrocartilage being bouncy like a racquetball, there's a little bit of movement here. This is very beneficial when it comes to birthing babies because we actually create hormones that cause the connective tissue in that area to relax so that it expands a little bit when you're giving birth. <clears throat> for the most part, for I guess other function, we're talking about holding our weight when we're walking, when we're sitting, that same kind of bouncy um, characteristic, I guess, that you have with the fibro cartilage kind of helps so that your bones aren't banging together. Instead, you've got a little bit more give to it. <clears throat> now, the last set of joints are the synovial joints. The synovial joints, 
anatomically are the most complex joints because they are the ones that have the most movement. We're not going to get into a whole lot of the microanatomy and physiology, but we are going to go through some examples of these joints. So <clears throat> we have six types. We have the plane joint, the saddle joint, the hinge joint, the pivot joint, the ball and socket, and the ellipsoid, also known as the condyloid joint. So if you think back to grade school, an ellipse was an oval. So ball and socket is kind of perfect ball fitting into a socket. Condyloid is actually more of an oval shape fitting into a socket. <clears throat> so let's talk planar joint. Planar joint. You have two flat opposing surfaces, okay? Planar joints can also be called gliding joints and they move on each other. Sometimes they can rotate, but pretty much you've only got movement, very, very simple movement of sliding back and forth over each other. So an example of this would be the vertebra, okay? <clears throat> so if I put a picture of the vertebra, let's say the, the spinal column, and I say, what type of joint is that? You would tell me it's a plane joint or a gliding joint. I don't care which one you use. They're both the same thing, just two different names for the same thing. Now, the saddle joint. The saddle joint is actually two opposing surfaces that kind of look like this. So you've got this shape and the same shape fitting in together. So you have kind of movement this way and movement this way. Your thumb is an example of this. So your thumb can do this and it can do this really well. And I know everybody's going, but you can do this. Yeah, you can. But if you really pay attention and feel what that feels like, it grinds in the corners because technically a saddle joint isn't supposed to do that. It's only supposed to move in two directions, this way and this way. That's it. But again, it is mobile. So the hinge joint, the convex cylinder of one bone fitting into the concave portion of another. You've got a piece like this, you've got a piece like this, and they fit together. So concave, convex, sticky outy. okay? It does work very similarly to a door hinge. There's a door over there, that's why I'm pointing, sorry. Um, so you get this simple movement of your elbow is a hinge joint and literally this is all it's designed to do and if you think about that shape that i showed you there is a stop to this because when it hits it can't go back anymore but that movement of a convex the ulna with um the convex, the trochlea, fitting into the concave, the ulna, um, is a hinge joint. Hinge joints don't really move that much. They're not that mobile, but they do one kind of open and close movement. <clears throat> Pivot joint. This is the radius and the ulna. This is this joint here. <clears throat> I told you that when we move our hand this is pivoting around you can actually see that here it pivots in a circle <clears throat> with a pivot joint you have a bone oh and the dens is a good example of this too you have a bone that is kind of seated against another bone with a piece of ligament in front of it and it pivots around so you don't have kind of a lot of movement, but you have that rotational movement happening in that one joint. <clears throat> so if I were to show you that joint, you would call it a pivot joint. If I were to show you the dens, you would call it a pivot joint because it's doing that circular or rotational movement. <clears throat> Sorry, <clears throat> I kind of choked at lunch over nothing because that's the way my life is. And now I've got that <clears throat> that I talked about. Anyway, so that's a pivot joint. Ball and socket. Got the ball's spherical head of one fitting into the socket of another. Your hip and your shoulder are perfect examples of this. <clears throat> 
Now, this shape allows for a lot of movement. I can rotate this, I can bring it out and in, I can bring it up and down. There's a lot of movement associated with this. So ball and socket joints are like never ending movement. They can pretty much go anywhere. And to be honest, a lot of our limitation of our movement is because our body's in the way. Ball and socket moves all over the place. So your shoulder, your hip, those are your two ball and socket joints. Admitted though, your hip is a little less mobile just because you've got so many ligaments and tendons in that area. It kind of does limit movement, but I can still lift my leg and lower it and go and go around, right? We can do that. Not that you can see it, but we can do that. Now the ellipsoid, again, you've got kind of an oval, fitting into a concave oval. So instead of having something that's a perfect ball fitting into a ball, now you've got something that's more oval in shape fitting into oval. Now this does affect the movement. It's not as mobile as a ball and socket because the corners kind of hit so you kind of have this movement this way and this movement this way that works really well. And while you can do the other movement a bit, it's not always that great. It's not always that successful. So the, let's do it this way, occipital condyle fitting into atlas. These are two oval shapes and they fit in there and they allow us to do this and this with our head. This that we do is because of the dens, that pivot joint. So know these joints, know how to identify them. Um, <clears throat> your knee, believe it or not, is actually a condyloid joint. It isn't uh, a hinge joint like your elbow, because if you look at the bottom surface of the fibula, I mean the fibula, the femur going to the top of the fibula, those condyles are ovals. And even the shape at the top of the tibia is ovals. Okay? Okay. So, yep, that's the end of unit two. That's the end of the lectures for unit two. Please make sure to let me know if these are better lectures or worse because at this point I'm not sure I'm kind of trying to get everything posted as quickly as possible um, if this didn't work for you then yeah we need to we need to go back to the other way okay hope you're having a good day and I'll get this posted as quickly as I possibly can